Relentlessly, unceasingly, the RAF are giving the Nazis no rest. This is the Mustang, the fastest army cooperation aircraft in the world. They've already been in action, ground strafing the enemy in the Axis-occupied countries across the English Channel. The RAF pilots like them. German soldiers in northern France do not. Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode from The Model Guy as we cover the Tamiya P-48 Mustang in 148 scale. I know that recently Airfix has released a P-51 and Meng has visited the aircraft and along with Edward has a kit in production. However, for me, this Mustang kit is still probably the best on the market because even though it was designed in 1994, there are very little issues with the kit. You have great fit, panel detail is good, uh, cowling on the top is one piece, covers up any seams, and generally with just some soldering wire and some other little bits and pieces, you can have a great Mustang. As I work on the interior here and start laying some primer, we'll talk about the story of the Mustang. And in 1940, before the Americans were even involved in World War II, the British Purchasing Commission had visited North American Aviation and asked them if they would produce Curtis P-40 aircraft on behalf of them. Now, that would be the same as today if a company went to Chevy and asked them to start building Ford trucks. Naturally, North American was a bit offended by this and said, hey, we can do a little bit better than that. We can give you a new aircraft from the paper up. And within 102 days, they had gone from a prototype on paper to rolling out the first Mustang for the RAF. Although the Mustang design came together quickly and the prototype was airborne less than a month after it rolled out, there were issues with the RAF accepting the aircraft because they found that the Mustang was very lackluster at high altitude and lacked the performance they already had with the Spitfire. The RAF, however, were the masters of making the best of bad situations and started using the Mustang as a tactical reconnaissance aircraft at low level. This lack of performance could be traced back to the Mustang having an Allison engine with a single stage supercharger. Why does a single stage supercharger make a difference? Well, let me try to explain it in layman's terms. When an engine burns fuel and oxygen, a normally aspirated engine that does not have a supercharger can only draw in about 85% of the volume of that cylinder with oxygen before it burns it at ground level. The higher that non-aspirated engine moves up in the atmosphere, the less oxygen can break in because it's trying to suck in thinner air. So instead of having 85% volumetric efficiency of that cylinder, you're now down at 60, 50, and even 45%. To get around this, if you put a supercharger on that engine, it forces air into the cylinder by compressing it. Now you go from having a cylinder that's only 85% efficient at ground level to 100% efficient or even higher depending on the PSI that that supercharger is running at. With the Royal Air Force looking at a way to make the Mustang a better aircraft, they eventually decided to try fitting in a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which was the exact same tried and tested engine that the Spitfire was already using. Once the Brits started testing the Merlin in the Mustang, they quickly realized they had a winner on their hands as the aircraft now had performance at altitude and could even take the bombers all the way to Berlin and back on paper. So they had to research it a little bit more and update the fuel tanks. And with this information, the United States Army Air Force took notice and went back to North America and said, how can we keep the Mustang improving? By adding another fuel tank behind the pilot and starting to build the Rolls-Royce engine under license from Packard, the Mustang quickly became the front-line fighter of the United States Army Air Force. At the start of 1944, the American 8th Air Force was finally able to provide an escort fighter for their heavy bombers to head deep into Germany and back. Where the bomber crews before had the tactic of avoiding Luftwaffe fighters, the Americans now revisited their tactics and realized with D-Day approaching, they needed to clear the skies of Luftwaffe fighters. The Luftwaffe knew they were in trouble at the end of February in 1944 when the 8th Air Force hit six different targets in six different days in what they called the Big Week raids. Where the Americans had been losing on average 30 bombers per raid due to enemy fighters with the Mustang alongside, they only lost 69 aircraft the entire week. A change had already been made and the Americans wanted to push it further. At the end of the Big Week, the Germans also realized that something had changed as well. Their fighter production industry had been attacked directly, and now they were finding Mustangs overhead when the escort should have long left. 
General Doolittle also wanted to make a change, and instead of having the P-51s fly close escort with the bombers, he ordered some squadrons to sweep ahead and hit German fighters before they could even get near the bombers. Some pilots of the German Air Force didn't even get near their planes as Mustangs started finding targets of opportunity on the ground. The Germans were no longer safe anywhere as in Europe. To keep the pressure on the Luftwaffe and get them back into the air, the Americans attacked Berlin for the first time in force on March 2nd with P-51s flying cover. Hermann Göring himself took notice, as he said when he seen the Mustangs over Berlin, he knew that Germany had lost the war. The heavy bombers continued pounding the German fighter industry until the end of March when they were pulled back to start supporting tactical missions to, in Normandy to support General Eisenhower's D-Day landings. Now that the bombers were only flying short missions, the Mustangs were no longer required to escort them, and they were cut loose to start hitting targets on the ground in Germany and Europe. With the Germans' fuel supply almost diminished, their fighters sat on the ground, easy pickings for the Mustangs and other fighters of the Allies, and they were so effective But by July 1944, the fighter threat from the German Luftwaffe had almost diminished after just six months of the Mustang being in service. Because I'm doing the Lou Mustang, it's an earlier version of the D that did not have the fillet for the tail, so I've actually found a resin piece by Ultracast to fit in its place. It was a pretty simple install, just a little bit of sanding, and it fits smoothly. The biggest difference you'll notice between a C model Mustang and the D model is that they cut the back of the aircraft down so and installed a canopy that was bubbled so the pilot had a full 360 degree view. Even though visibility was improved, one of the issues of that cutting of the back of the aircraft was the Mustang was now unstable a little bit more on the longitudinal axis, and pilots complained that the aircraft wasn't as stable. So on later models of the D, they added in that fillet to give the aircraft a little more stability. But because I am doing the Lou Mustang and I want to be a little more authentic, I decided to make the effort to chop and install the proper tail for the kit. Let's now compare the Mustang to another famous aircraft, the British counterpart, the Spitfire. How do they compare as fighters? And the long story short is that they can't be compared fairly. And the reason for that is, one, the Mustang has been designed as an escort fighter. So the range is the first thing that's in mind of the designers. It's fast, it's maneuverable, but one of the things with the laminar wings is it takes away from the turning radius of the Mustang. The Spitfire has the advantage of, when compared to the Mustang, it can outturn it. Both aircraft are the similar speed. The Mustang is a little bit faster. But then you also have to look at the training styles for the aircraft. The Americans knew that the Mustang was fast, so they didn't really try to dogfight with German aircraft because the German aircraft could also outturn the Mustang when they were flown by a competent pilot. But what Mustang pilots did and they'd learn this in the P-47 as well, is a boom and zoom style dogfighting. And it's ironic because that's how the Germans originally started fighting in early in the war. They would basically see an aircraft, bounce down on it, and while they're at their top speed, they would hit the aircraft with gunfire and then keep their speed up and simply pull away. Whereas a Spitfire pilot, they're, they'll do some boom and zoom as well, However, they're primarily a knife fighter with the Spitfire, so the Spitfire's maneuverable, it can turn tight, and that's the style that the British were working with. Now, if you were to take a Mustang and what's called a neutral dogfight and go against a Spitfire, it's going to be an interesting fight because the Mustang pilot's going to be looking to keep his speed up, stay away from a turning fight, and the Spitfire is going to be looking to get the Mustang drawn into a turning fight. So take your pilot who has the exact same training in the aircraft or just as capable in the Spitfire and the pilot Mustang is just as capable and you go head to head it's going to be hard to call which fighter is going to come out on top if it turns into a boom and zoom fight Mustang if it's a turning fight the edge may go to the Spitfire now again you have to remember that when the Spitfire was first designed it was designed for home defense of England so its original range was only about 30 minutes of fuel before it had to come back to land and compared to the Mustang that would fly for four hours with the bombers, get into a dogfight over the target area or on the way to the target, and then fly four hours back to England. So again, Mustang, fast, a lot of firepower with the 650 cals, but an aircraft that would try to avoid dogfighting. Now, when they're going against the German pilots towards the end of the war, German pilots didn't have the same rotation system or the same experience as the Mustang pilots. The 
Americans would have 250 to 300 hours of training coming into the theater of operations. German pilots in 1944, towards the end of the war, didn't have the fuel supplies to get the same amount of training. You would have pilots that would be going up against the Mustangs that would only have 20, 30 hours flying time. So when you take a pilot that has that much training in an aircraft that's fast, gunfire, and he knows how to use it and put it against pretty much a green recruit that's still learning to fly, the Mustang is going to pretty much come out on top. The Germans, because they didn't have that same rotation system, they expected their pilots to fly until they're either invalidated in combat or killed. So your core of pilots who started the war in Spain was pretty much non-existent in 1944-45. So again, when you're looking at the Mustang, it is a great aircraft. But the question I pose is, was it as capable as people think it is? If the German pilots in 1944-45 had the same training and experience that the pilots at the start of the war had, I think that air war would have turned out a little bit differently because the Germans did have their good pilots early on. Now, the BF 109K and the Falkwolf, uh, I believe it's the Dora, those aircraft were both capable of keeping with the Mustang and outturning it. So, again, pilot experience was the big factor. I think that the Mustang was a great aircraft, but if you were to compare it to the German planes at the time solely at the technical level, it was pretty much an even aircraft. It could just fly longer distances. So, again, all I'm saying is that it's kind of a hard question to ask is, was the Mustang better than blank aircraft? Because at the end of the day, it may not have been. It was just a question of pilot experience, training, and tactics. One other factor that's overlooked when you're comparing the Mustang to German aircraft is the fact that in 1944 and 45, bomber raids were consisting of like 800 to 1,000 bombers escorted by 600 to 800 P-51 Mustangs. So if you have like 600 or 800 fighters and you might run into maybe 30, 40 German aircraft, that's not even going to be close to a fair fight. So again, it's like watching Mike Tyson fight Stephen Hawking. It's just one side taking a beating and there's nothing they can do about it. And just to close the debate, one story I've read by Eric Brown, who flew both the Mustang and the Spitfire for a test establishment, he said that having experience in both aircraft, he preferred the Spitfire because he found it was easier to fly and he would rather be in that aircraft in a dogfight over Germany in Berlin. However, the only problem with that would be if he's in a Spitfire over Germany, he's not coming back to England because he's out of fuel. Now, getting back to the build, you'll notice I've just fired two layers of clear coat on the Mustang and I'm starting to polish it. The reason I've done that is I have two different paints here on the aircraft right now. I have an acrylic and I have an enamel. So I need a common base layer there to start laying my wash on. So because I've fired a, a lacquer clear on top of them, I shouldn't have any mixing as I start to do my wash and wipe it away. So that should give me a nice even base to start with. One part that I don't have a clip here for for this video is when you add your two to three layers of clear, I sand it down with a 3000 grit sanding sponge just to level out the decals. Because there's a carrier film on the decal, if you sand it out and then put another clear coat on top of that and polish it, you shouldn't have that fine ridge you'll find, especially with Tamiya's decals because they're so thick. If you're wondering what I've used to mix this oil wash, I've simply used Tester's enamel thinner with a, I think it was like a $20 oil set pack I got off Amazon. So a little bit of that oil paint into the enamel, depending on how thick or thin I want that wash, mix it up and paint it onto the aircraft. And usually give it about I'm going to say about half an hour to an hour to start to dry and once you've noticed it started to dry I'll take a shop towel to wipe it away not paper towel but a shop towel and the reason for that is shop towels don't have that lint factor so you don't have to worry about having to try to dig lint out of your paint afterwards here I'm just adding some wear to the aircraft with a foam and silver paint and now here's a big step for this kit that I think you'll like uh, because it's 148 scale, I decided to add in the fuel lines for the fuel tanks, for the drop tanks. So what I've done is taken a center punch, marked the bungs on the tank, and then taken my Dremel and drilled them out. And what I'll do after I've painted them is I'll add soldering wire into those tanks and run them up to the actual fuselage where they would pin in. So it just adds a little bit more detail to the kit, and it's something anybody can do. And here I am just marking the holes 
under the wings next to the pylons, which will also be drilled out. The drill bits are PCB drill bits, so they're very fine and you can get very small holes with them. Here I am just knocking some of the paint off the flaps just to show a little bit of wear from bumping up inside the wing. And this is simple because I've sprayed Mr. Color Silver and then painted on top of it. So by just using a toothpick, I can just scratch that top layer of paint away. And just installing the flap here. And again, because this is a Tamiya kit, you can, again, it's a shake and bake kit. Like there's almost no issues that come up. Here I'm using Ultracast wheels and I've used my wife's Cricut machine again to create a paint mask. So just going into Cricut software, creating a circle template, cut it out, throw it on the tire, zero issues. And my next build video, I've actually painted all of the markings on using the Cricut. Here I'm adding MIGS airfield dust just to put a little bit of weathering on the wheel. Before applying the dust, I used Tamiya's black panel liner just to accent and bring out the details in the rim. And once that was finished up, I was ready to go back to the drop tanks and finish the fuel lines and in installing them. So here I've just put a little bit of super glue on the soldering wire and put it down through the bungs. And after those have dried in place, I will put the fuel tank under the wing and secure it. And once it's dried, then I will use a pair of tweezers to guide that soldering wire into the wing. So now you have a plumbed tank. Now that all the paint has dry, I'm sealing it with All Clad's clear coat. I shoot this about 20, 21 PSI, and it pretty much sucks the shine right out of the kit. It wasn't until I finished the weathering that I noticed that I did not paint around the gun port. So this was the last one of addition. And then I went on to adding the fuel stains on the aircraft. This is MIGS fuel and oil stains, and just putting it lightly in the areas where the crews would access the engine to service it. One of the things about this aircraft as well is the Lu-4 was kept in pretty decent shape. Like there was some wear, but it was overall clean, like no exhaust stains. And the CO of the unit kept a very tight ship. So the aircraft weren't too, too dirty. And this was famously photographed with three other Mustangs. Unfortunately, the pilot of this Mustang, Thomas Christian, who was a colonel and squadron leader, died in an attack a few days after the photo was taken when his Mustang was shot down dive bombing a target. Here I have the Dremel out again and I'm drilling out my exhausts to make those a little bit more pleasing to the eye because again the kit was made in 1994 so the exhausts were not hollow. So just I draw, drill a pilot hole and then open it up a little bit with a bigger drill bit. And now using a chrome pen I'm going to paint the exhaust and then airbrush in some faint to me a smoke just to dirty them up a little bit and a little bit of rust and while that chrome pen is still in hand I will use it to do my wingtip lights so I'll put a couple dots on and then once it's dry cover it with a clear red or green paint same with the recognition lights underneath the aircraft put that silver down first and then cover it with a clear paint that pretty much concludes this build as I put the canopy in place. If you liked the video, click subscribe. If you didn't like the video, leave a comment saying why. I know music's been the big thing, so I dropped the music entirely for this build, and maybe you enjoyed it, or maybe you're sick of hearing me talk. So again, leave a comment. I hope you enjoyed the video, and see you next time.